Okay, hi there, my name is Eileen Kennedy and I'm going to take you through a quick presentation on how to uh, create videos using nothing but your mobile phone. So what this will start out with is communicating through a visual medium. You'll learn a bit about basic video composition, some video recording tips and tricks, some audio production tips, and then I'll point you in the direction of some editing apps and resources that'll be useful to you. So the first thing to think about is the kind of content that you're creating. Um, a video is just another type of content. So you want to make sure that it is engaging, visually appealing, tells some sort of a story, and is relevant if you're promoting a brand or a product, if there's an overall message or theme that you're trying to communicate, make sure that your video stays on topic. And it should include a call to action. If you're a marketing student, you're probably familiar with a call to action. So this is essentially at the end of the video, you tell someone what to do with the information that they've learned or the emotions that the video has made them feel. It could be something as simple as click here to learn more, a URL, website address, uh, something along those lines, just to make sure your video has a purpose. So if you are doing some sort of promotional content, there are a few different varieties or themes under which your video could fall. It could be a discovery video, which you want to use to let people know who you are or what you do. Advertisements are a general example of this. A product, a product video might explain what you offer in some form of greater detail than what people might already know. And this could be located on a website or on your social media. A testimonial video could be a recording of your satisfied customers talking about your product. This would usually sit on your website. Um, oops, I've got product videos twice, but anyway, yeah. So a detailed product video would explain something a bit more specific. It might be sort of a how-to video or something like that. And then you have your thank you videos, which could be good for customer retention. And these could be delivered uh, directly to the customers through email or something along these lines. Now here are a few examples of videos uh, created by the University of Galway, and you can find any of these on the university's YouTube channel if you just want to see some examples. Um, most of them are created by amateurs, and by that I mean that they're not made by official production companies. You'll see something like um, the Arctic Travel Vlog, which was created by Dr. Jessamine Fairfield, and this was just uh, Jessamine out on a ship in the Arctic uh, with a phone recording her emotions and the experience and doing just a small bit of editing and it made a really impactful, powerful video and also felt extremely authentic. So before you start with your videos and um, or really with any content that you want to create, I suppose, you want to think about what you're trying to communicate there must be some kind of message that you're trying to get across. You want to know who is your audience. Now this is going to determine um, the vocabulary that you use, the style in which you record, sort of how much jargon you can use, if it's for novices or experts, and where's your content going to be hosted? Is it going to be delivered to people through YouTube? Is it going to be on some other app, say TikTok? Uh, is it a video ad where people are likely to click away after the first 10 seconds so you need to pack a lot of information in there at the beginning or try to catch them and make them want to watch more at the beginning? So this is all stuff that you have to keep in mind. You can see from my examples here on the side, we have some videos that are obviously intended for very different audiences. So we have, um, you know, uh, kind of a kids video where kids are learning about marine life. Uh, you have this video called How to Make Plutonium. Um, in the How to Make Plutonium video, it's clear that nothing about the setting is accidental. This guy is going for kind of a mad scientist look in his very cluttered office. He clearly thought about how he could make the scene appeal to whoever he was communicating to. And then we have this one down here of just somebody doing a, a DNA experiment. And it's obviously a little bit rougher, not quite as formal, but because of the way it is, um, or because of the audience that this person is trying to meet or trying to communicate with and because he meets them where they are, probably on TikTok, although it looks like this was reposted to Twitter, uh, it is still very effective. So your videos don't have to be perfectly polished as long as you're 
communicating with the audience in the right place in a way that they appreciate and understand. So let's move straight into learning a bit about video composition and the different tools that you can use. So this is a quotation that I quite like, and it is the single most important component of a camera is the 12 inches behind it. So the idea here is that you can have you know, the fanciest DSLR camera on the market, you can have an instant camera, or you can have a five-year-old smartphone. It doesn't really matter what kind of camera you have because you have the 12 inches behind it, which is you. It's your creativity, it's your unique perspective, and that is the most important component. So we'll talk about the phone camera. Depending on the type of your phone that you have, you'll have different levels of control that you can have over your shots. In most cameras, however, you will be able to control the focus and the exposure, which is something that you might not expect to have that level of control. In order to adjust the focus, which is the area of the shot that's clear, you want to hold up your phone to a scene or to whatever setting you're filming and tap on the person or the item that you want to be in focus. It's easiest to see the difference here if you have something very close to the phone and very far away. If you tap on the far away item and then the close item, you'll probably see the focus shift between those two things and whichever other item is not being tapped on will go a little bit blurry. You can also control the exposure by tapping on different items in front of the camera. This will adjust the brightness to perfectly match whatever you're tapped on. And it'll be most obvious to you if you have, say, an item in front of a window. When you tap on the window, the item will go dark and the outside will be properly exposed. Tapping on the item, the item will be properly exposed and the window will go uh, usually overly bright or something like that. Um, you can lock these as well so they won't kind of automatically adjust as your scene's changing. And depending on your phone, you typically do it by tapping and holding. So you have your phone app open, you're holding it up to the scene that you want to record. Say there's a person standing here and you would tap on that person, on the phone screen of course, and hold your finger there and you'll probably see a lock key or a lock symbol appear. This means that the focus and exposure are locked to that person. Then within your camera settings, you'll see you have several different options for the recording quality. Usually you'll have options for 4K, Full HD, or regular HD. It's not hugely important which of these that you choose, but you just want to keep in mind how much storage space you have available on your phone and maybe how much space you have once you're going to have to edit your video because you will have to hold on to all of this footage until your editing is done. And obviously 4K footage is a much bigger file than regular HD footage. Then again, if your video is going onto YouTube, you might want that full 4K footage quality so it can be viewed back on a bigger screen. If it's just going on to TikTok or Snapchat and you know it's only going to be viewed on a mobile device, then you can get away with a lower quality. A fun little um, trick that you can use is to turn the grid lines on in the settings. They might have a different name, but essentially what this does is it puts kind of a grid over the preview that you'll see in your phone. And I'll show you in a moment why that's helpful. When we get into composing our shots, looking at video composition, the rule of thirds is a really helpful rule to follow. And this is where our grid lines come in. So the rule of thirds connects to the golden ratio, this idea that there's a divine ratio by which everything is more aesthetically pleasing. You can find it in nature and also in classical artwork. There's a pretty basic example up here on the side of the screen where we have the shot from the American office. We have our character positioned on a third. His eye is actually directly on a third. And this makes a nice kind of off-center but still balanced and professional feeling shot. We also have this shot down below of this little puppy and the tire. And both the puppy and the bicycle tire are on one of those intersecting third lines. Thinking of this and using the grid lines can just help to guide you to more simply compose aesthetically pleasing shots without having to put too, too much thought into it. You can, of course, compose your shots with your subject centered up, but then you just have to put a little bit more effort into making sure your surroundings look nice as well. So putting someone on the third is just a quick and easy shortcut to use while you're getting started. 
couple of other important composition techniques to keep in mind are ensuring that you have proper headroom and lead room. This is something that can very quickly make your both photos and videos look really professional or very amateurish. So when it comes to headroom, what you want to do is ensure that there is less space above the head than there is under the chin. So it's even okay if you cut off the top of the head a little bit like you can see in this image of Frodo here. As long as the face is fully in frame and the chin isn't cut off, then you're doing it right. With the lead room, you want more space in the direction that your subject is facing. This way, if you need to pan the camera to keep up with someone as they're walking, you can do it more easily. Or if, like me, they talk with their hands, then the hands will stay in the shot. And it just feels that little bit more natural. You won't necessarily notice when this is done right if you're watching a film, but if it's done wrong, it does stand out quite clearly. Here's my little pop quiz. So if we look at our lead rooms and our head rooms, I'll just pause for a couple of seconds so you can take a minute to think about which of these might look more correct to you. And there are the answers. So with our lead rooms, we can see that the Obama shot here has more space in the direction that he's facing rather than behind him. He has space to move his hands. Um, in the bottom one, it looks a bit like he's maybe about to walk into a wall. Now this was definitely done intentionally by the photographer in this shot because they probably wanted to make it look like he was a bit trapped, like he was out of options. Um, if that's the tone that you're trying to convey, then that's absolutely acceptable. You want to just know these rules so that you know when and why to break them. When we get into our headrooms over here on the other side where we have Michael D. Higgins, the top one is very awkward in its composition. It looks a bit like his chin is sort of resting on the bottom of the frame, which makes you feel like something's going to happen, like something's going to come in on top of him. Uh, it also makes him look shorter than he is, which we do not want to do to poor Michael D. Higgins. So the lower one down is the one with the, with the correct composition. This is a video that I am going to link um, below for you, and it features the photography of Steve McCurry. Oops, let me just not play that of Steve McCurry, who's best known for the photograph Afghan Girl. Uh, and what it does is it'll take you through a variety of shots and then show little graphics to illustrate the different shot composition techniques that help to create aesthetically pleasing images. Um, so I'd recommend that you just maybe pause here and take a moment to look through that video. And then once you come back, uh, this is something that I recommend checking out if you want to get into mobile phone photography or videography. Now, I know this is a video production class, but I have been talking thus far just about photo composition techniques. And the reason for that is that a video is really just a moving photo. So if you can get the composition right on photography, that's an excellent place to start before you move into video. So if you're looking at Moviography Awards, it stands for Mobile Photography, as you might imagine, you can see some really impressive examples of photographs that were taken on mobile phones. And it just helps to kind of get in your mind that this is an acceptable tool for creating sort of high quality photography and videography. There we go. So we have these clear leading lines here, right? and they kind of draw your eye down here. I really do wish that there was maybe something here to catch your eye as well, because that is where they seem to be pointing you. But they also do point you just to this individual here who's sitting alone. You have this nice line that comes up to him as well. And if we divide it up into thirds, we can see that our subject is actually positioned fairly nicely on this third here. So it is a really um, professionally composed shot. This one here has got great use of reflections going on. You can see the thirds are actually very clearly defined here. She's fairly centered up and that's okay. Like I was saying, it just makes it, you know, cause you a little bit more work in your composition, but there and there are some very lovely thirds. And we also have that kind of natural window created by these openings around her eyes. This one here, the jumper, you've got great use of contrast also some nice leading lines, 
and some really good symmetry with the way you have kind of a fold there. Untitled here, we've got a kind of natural frame and then frames within frames, which is a very nice approach as well. I love this one called Brave, one cow facing the opposite direction. So you have your pattern and then your broken pattern and also your thirds with the tops of the cows and the top of the grass here. Two more thirds there on the cow's tails and then our subject in the center where I is drawn. This one here, we have our thirds again, right? So here would be a third, here's a third. Our house lands on a third. Please excuse my wiggly lines that I'm drawing. Another third there, more or less. And then you've got this excellent, excellent contrast between the white everywhere and then that shock of red in the barn. So that's when you're looking at photography. When you're looking at videography, you have to think about the way in which your shots are going to all come together in addition to the way that they look when they're standing alone. So right now what I'm going to do is basically give you the vocabulary that you need to describe these different types of shots and also talk a little bit about how one shot should be cut against another. So we'll start out with establishing shots. Now, um, an establishing shot is usually quite a wide shot that sets up the scene. You'll find this very often at the very beginning of movies or the very beginning of sitcoms. Star Wars is a great example of this. You'll get that kind of rolling text that you have in Star Wars, and then what you'll typically see is a shot of space and a spaceship, and then you cut into a room or something. So because the spaceship has come first, you know that that room is inside the spaceship. Your brain has made that connection. If you saw the room first, you wouldn't necessarily know where it was located. The same thing happens in sitcoms, rom-coms, things like this. You'll probably see a shot of a city, then an apartment building, and then the inside of an apartment. Because of the order in which those shots have appeared, you know that that apartment is inside that building, in that city, and you understand the scene for what's going on. A long shot is another very common type of shot, which can sometimes be used as an establishing shot, and sometimes it'll follow the establishing shot. So in this kind of shot, you'll really get an idea for what to expect from a scene. You'll have usually the character and the setting, maybe some information about the time of day. So in this one from Forrest Gump, we can see we have forest, we have a grave, we can see that it's either very early in the morning or late in the evening because of the dark shadows of that tree against the sky. And also it's just a lovely shot. You know, we've got forest on a third, we have this tree on a third, you have that dark contrast, the ground kind of falls along a third line there as well. Uh, and the grave is right in the center, sort of dead center you could even think of. So it's a really powerful image. Medium shot is what you will likely use most frequently. A medium shot is usually just about waist up, but it's important not to ever kind of cut anyone off at their joints. So you wouldn't want to end a shot exactly on someone's hips or exactly on their knees. It would just feel kind of uncomfortable if you were looking at it. And I can't really describe why other than that. But if you're watching TV or a movie, you'll notice that no shots cut people off like that because it does just feel a little strange. They'll try to cut in between the joints. Uh, so anyway, a two shot, you don't have to be too careful about your headroom here because the shot is pulled out just a little bit. Um, so we can see with this one, the heads are more or less in the center of the shot, um, vertically, I mean. So you have kind of an equal amount of space above and below the head. Um, and then, however, we still need to be conscious of our lead room. So more direction or more space in the direction that our subjects are facing and moving. Um, just, you know, in addition to that, it's a lovely shot in terms of our symmetry with uh, the sky here and the water and these nice kind of diagonals that come through the shot. So it's very nicely composed. Next, we have our close up. So a close-up is a shot that you will want to save for your most emotional or intense moments. In this Where's Johnny scene from The Shining, 
you have medium shot after medium shot in the sequence as Jack Nicholson is chasing his wife through the hotel. And then finally he gets up to the, the sort of bathroom where she's been hiding and he hacks through the door and he says, here's Johnny. And you cut to that close up as his face comes through the door and it is extremely jarring and scary and shocking. If the entire sequence had been shot in close ups, that one moment wouldn't have as much of a punch. So it's great to save these close-ups for your key message, your most emotional moment. And then you have the macro shot or extreme close-up. Now this is something that our mobile phones can actually do quite well. And some of the newer phones will have settings specifically for capturing these macro shots. To get this kind of a shot on your phone, what you want to do is move your phone close to an item until you see it go out of focus and then pull back very gradually just until it catches that focus. You should get something very close to the lens that's nice and clear and everything around it looking kind of lovely and blurry and really beautiful. So you can get these nice professional looking shots. Now the cutaway shot or the insert shot can be a little bit trickier to do effectively but it's very useful when it comes to editing and when it comes to kind of managing the pacing of your story. So in this clip from up, we have the alarm clock rings and our main character hits the alarm clock to stop it. The shots cut in from this sort of medium to wide shot of him in bed to the close up of the alarm clock. So what this does is it gives us a little bit of information about his life, the time he gets up, you can see the pill bottles in the background a bit more clearly than you might have been able to with just the long shot. But also it helps with the pacing because, you know, if he was just going to hit the alarm clock and then get up, it could feel like kind of a long sequence. But if you cut into hitting the alarm clock and then it cuts to the next scene, then it's a nice fast paced story and it feels that little bit more professional as well. Now, I just want to mention lighting quickly because if you don't get your lighting right, then getting any of these other shot tips correctly doesn't really matter either. So when it comes to lighting, you don't want your subject to be in shadow unless it's for creative or intentional reasons. So with this image of this person um, on the left, for example, you'll see he's in shadow. He kind of looks like maybe his identity is obscured for some reason. Um, I'm assuming it wasn't done intentionally in this particular shot. What probably happened is they just thought the outside looked a bit nicer than the inside, so they want that to be the background. And you will find when you're interviewing people, they will always ask for you to film them against the window because the outside looks nice. However, this puts them in shadow, and if you tap on them to get the exposure right, then the outside will be overexposed and you won't even be able to see it. So what would have worked much better with this shot is if the person had turned around so that the daylight was falling on his face and it would have you know, made him a lot easier to see. Or if you really do want to get that outside background in, just go outside to film the shot. That works as well. Of course, then you have to be conscious of rain and wind and noise and everything else. So there's a balance to be struck. In this shot on the other side um, of Harrison Ford, I just want to illustrate it as an example of where the lighting is quite nice. Uh, you have this sort of not bright, but not too dark lighting. It's nice and soft and even. There aren't any really harsh shadows. Everything's sort of gently lit and it looks quite nice. Okay, now when you're going out to actually do some filming, one thing you want to keep in mind is keeping your shots steady. Uh, there are a few ways to do this, and phones usually have pretty good image stabilizers at this point. Um, I quite like to use this sort of T-Rex tip, where you scrunch in your elbows really close to your body, sort of set your feet shoulder width apart, so you're nice and strong and solid in your position, and then you can hold your phone in front of you, so that way your whole body is working to keep it steady. Whereas if you have your arms out a little bit farther in front of you, they can be quite shaky uh, and then your your image will look a bit shaky as well. 
Using a selfie stick can surprisingly be a great way to keep an image stable and you can also get kind of nice shots of the camera moving along this way as well. This item up here is called a gimbal. Uh, it's basically a mini steady cam that you can use for your phone and we have some of these available to borrow from the makerspace in the library if you ever want to use them. Then kind of a cheap sneaky way to get a tiny tripod set up is to use a plug like this. You can sit your camera or your phone, I should say, in it right here. Now this is not a great illustration, but if you see what I mean, it'll sit in there like that. And then these prongs act as a small tripod. Um, so, you know, if you're ever stuck, you want to get a nice steady shot, sit one of those on a table, sit your phone on it and you're good. There is sort of a uh, argument about how you should hold your phone for different purposes. Uh, I always, always tell people to just go with horizontal. The reason is that holding your phone horizontally like this is the shape of your computer screen, it's the shape of your television screen, and it's a little bit easier to compose your shots on a horizontal screen. Um, so just do this when in doubt. Also, if you need to later on crop your shots to put your content on Instagram, TikTok, or Snapchat, you can then crop in your horizontal shot fairly easily, whereas it's very difficult to crop out from a vertical to a horizontal shot. One of the easiest ways that you'll probably find of telling a story is to do it through an interview. Uh, so this is just a kind of simple way to set up your interview. It's easiest to do it if you have an assistant and an interviewer. So you have one person to work the camera and one person to conduct the interview. If you don't have uh, two people to work on your crew, then I would say hold your phone here and ask the questions because this way the interviewee can talk to you rather than having to talk to the phone and then talk to you because they might be shifting back and forth between the phone and you and it can make them look a little bit uncomfortable and they might actually feel a little bit uncomfortable in that situation. You want to also be sure to keep the camera at eye level with the person that you're interviewing because if they're looking up or looking down it can make the shot seem a bit uncomfortable. Um, if you are planning to cut yourself out of the interview, which means you're not a part of the story, it's only the individual, then you want to be careful not to speak while they're speaking. So make sure you don't go mm-hmm or laugh at their jokes or anything because, you know, that your, your voice will just be sort of a disembodied voice coming out of nowhere. And you can even tell them that at the beginning, say, you know, just because I'm not responding to your jokes doesn't mean they're not funny, I just don't want my voice in this. And that can kind of, you know, break the tension a little bit as well, especially if they're feeling kind of nervous about being on camera. I also always ask subjects to spell their names at the start. Um, you know, it can just make things a lot easier at the end if you want to add a little text card to say their name at the bottom. And you might meet the one person in the world who spells Jeff with three Fs or something like that. Another tip I have for conducting an interview is to try to ask open-ended questions. So what I mean by this is if I was doing an interview about, um, I don't know, finding accommodation in Galway, and I said, did you find accommodation this year? They would either say yes or they would say no, and that would be the end of the interview and it wouldn't be very interesting. Or, could, or I could say, tell me a bit about the process of finding accommodation this year and then they're going to tell a story. And that's a much more valuable thing to have in an interview. Up here, I have this diagram where I've just sort of um, included the way that you could potentially set up an interview. So you can see I have the camera right over the interviewer's shoulder. This is the interviewee. This is just, you know, you can kind of ignore these. These are just regarding ways to light a shot. And the interviewer and interviewee will be speaking to each other and the camera then is getting a shot which looks something like this. So because of the way the camera is shooting and the way that the subject is looking, your shot is going to look something like this, pardon my drawings, with your subject here 
and the lead room is going to be in this direction. So that's more or less the way they're looking because they're looking at the interviewer. So you get a nice shot with your subject on a third and then, you know, whatever nice things you want to put in the background. Maybe you want to put like, do you know, a plant back here or something like that, just to fill in the space a little bit. So it looks nicely composed. I will pop some videos into the comments or into the um, description below so you can see some examples of interviews. Now, audio is extremely important. You want to um, keep in mind that viewers will forgive bad video. If your video is sh shaky, out of focus, pixelated, viewers will be okay with this, but they will not forgive bad audio. You probably know from attending online meetings how frustrating it is when you can't hear someone properly. You just don't know what's going on and you're more likely to turn the video off. So my advice to you is to find a quiet place to record, preferably without wind or birds making noises. Uh, you can buy a cheap microphone or you can borrow one from the makerspace in the library. You can also use your headphones built-in microphone. So if you have AirPods or something like this, even the little um, earbuds that come with your phone will have a built-in microphone and that works quite well. Or if you're doing a voiceover type thing, uh, you can record that underneath a blanket, inside a closet, in a car, just somewhere that will help to muffle the echoes a little bit. So I'm recording this in my home office and you can probably hear it's a little bit echoey. So this isn't the ideal location for recording a voiceover, um, but I think this slideshow would have been a little weird if I was recording it in a closet. Next up is music. Music can really set the tone for your video and it can also mask some distracting background sounds. For example, if there's an air conditioner, a heater, or maybe your refrigerator humming away, the music can help to cover that. Now there are lots of places where you can get royalty free music. You can find it online from places like the YouTube audio library and I have the link to the audio library there or from bensound.com. Just be sure to uh, include the proper attribution when necessary. So all you have to do there is say music compliments of, you know, whoever the artist is. You can also make your own soundtrack with a tool like GarageBand or Audacity. Or another tip is make friends with musicians and take advantage of their skills. But again, do just credit people appropriately. I have a few tips as well that I've picked up just from making videos in the past. First one is zoom with your legs. Now, what I mean by this is if you want to get closer to a subject or an item that you're recording, zoom in by walking closer to it. Don't zoom in by using the pinch to zoom feature on your phone, because all you'll be doing there is blowing up the pixels. You won't actually be zooming. So you'll just be lowering the quality of your shot. Next, you want to clean the lens. Our cameras are with us all day long uh, because our cameras are in our phones. So there is a lot of potential for them to get kind of greasy and smudged. So you just want to give it a quick wipe to make sure that your images are the highest quality they can be. Next, watch out for distracting backgrounds. This is my big weakness. I will spend so much time on my headroom, my lead room, my rule of thirds that I won't notice that maybe there's a big exit sign behind someone and it's really distracting. So just look at every corner of your shot before you hit record. And then finally, this might sound like an obvious one, but always ensure there's plenty of storage on your phone. So I just want to add a note on branding. So the official name of the university is University of Galway. You should not abbreviate this um, either in speaking or writing in your videos. You should check the brand guidelines and if you want to be sure about maybe the colors that you use and things along those lines. And I have that URL here. And when it comes to adding the logo to the video, you don't have to have the logo on screen throughout you can add just the intro and the outro graphics, which are available at the link I have there on the screen, universityofgalway.ie slash internal slash marketing slash brand slash video intro outro. I know it's a bit of a long URL. Um, and if for any reason you can't access that, you can email the marketing department at marketing at universityofgalway.ie and they'll be able to get that content to you. Now, editing. 
I just want to give you a tiny bit of background on editing. Originally, er, originally uh, it was the process of cutting footage. So editing was a linear process, which involved copying footage from one tape to another, or cutting up bits of film and um, combining them, physically gluing them together. It was a very, very long and a destructive process. Today we have nonlinear editing, which is non-destructive, it's digital, and it means that you can move clips, trim clips, split them, duplicate them, arrange them however you want, manage audio tracks, make as many changes as you need to without degrading the quality of your recordings. So I just want to mention this to you for when you are inevitably pulling your hair out working on your edits, because editing can be the toughest part, but it can also be the most fun and the most rewarding part. Now this is just a quick little timeline uh, looking at the 1900s when you were editing by hand. In 1924 you had these massive machines, 1950s you're working on videotape on these also big machines that sort of look like, I don't know, DJ decks or something. In 1971 we move into the digital age, but these machines were huge. And then in 1991 we start to get our at-home editing software that can be used by anyone. Editing is referred to as the invisible art, because if it's done well, you might not even notice it. Um, try watching, you know, the next time you're watching TV or a movie or something, try counting how many different shots there are or how many cuts there are in a scene, and you'll be really surprised that there's a huge number of shots that you wouldn't necessarily notice because the action flows between them, or they flow with the pacing of the movie or the film. Uh, it really can be quite astounding. Now the app that I am going to recommend to you to use for editing is called Kinemaster. You don't have to use this app, but I find it useful because it is um, free to export videos with a watermark, and you can use it for Android or iPhone. Uh, again, just make sure you don't delete those original video clips. If you have a different preference for a, a, a platform that you like to edit with, that's fine as well. You can obviously go with that. Um, for example, if you like to use Premiere Pro, um, which is an Adobe product, you can use that on the computers in the Makerspace. It's available on two of the computers in there, so you can book time in there to do some editing if you like. There we go. Now, I won't go through all of this in this video, but um, I will link a video below that has a really good comprehensive tutorial on KineMaster, but if anyone's done any editing before, you will sort of recognize the basics here. They're fairly universal to any video editor. You have an area to add in your video clips, add your music or adjust volume, record some voiceovers, add cutaways, and then you've got your timeline, which is the visual representation of the film that you've created. Subtitling is pretty important to keep in mind. 85% of online viewers end up watching videos without sound. Now you will find that there are built-in subtitling tools in some apps like YouTube or Facebook, um, but they're not always accurate. So you do want to just double check those subtitles that have been created within these apps and correct them as necessary. In general, it's essential for your videos to be accessible to a wider audience. It also makes them more likely to pop up in front of people because accessible videos will be favored in the algorithms on a lot of these sites and they'll choose to promote the ones that are more um, available to a wider audience. So when it comes to subtitling, it is a bit of extra, extra work, but I recommend that you put it in anyway. Now, I want to mention planning, and you might think it's maybe a little bit strange that I've gone through the whole presentation, I'm only now getting to planning. But the reason is that you sort of need to know what's involved in this before you get to the planning stage. And there are a couple of different options for planning. Uh, you can either write a script, or you can draw a storyboard, or actually you could do both. Uh, what a storyboard is, is it's basically the comic strip representation of what your film is going to look like. And it can make the process of going out and filming them much easier, because you'll be able to match your screen direction to what you have in your sketches, you'll be able to know how to set up your scenes, what type of day you need, all of this sort of stuff will already be brought in to your sort of consciousness, so you won't get out 
on site and then realize that you've forgotten to get something. Uh, and I will add this video into the comments. It's an example of a storyboard through um, the Jurassic Park scene and you'll be able to see the storyboard side by side with footage of the actual movie so you can see how that storyboard translates into the finished product. You do not have to be a good artist for this by any stretch of the imagination. It's totally fine. You can draw stick figures. It still does the job. And then we get to borrowing equipment. Now I did mention a couple of times about how the makerspace in the library has uh, gimbals, microphones, and also PCs that you can use for your video editing. Uh, in order to book PCs and equipment, you just go to the Makerspace website at library.universityofgalway.ie slash makerspace, and you can make your reservations there and then collect your equipment or use the PCs in the library. Now, I just want to leave you with uh, one final message, which is this quotation from Grace Coddington. And what it says is, always keep your eyes open, keep watching, because whatever you see can inspire you. So just be aware of what kind of videos you find striking. Is it videos that are heartwarming or ones that use humor? Is it ones that surprise you? Is it ones that are really visually striking? What is it about them that draws you in? And see if you can practice replicating that and then start to develop your own style around it. That's my recommendation to you. Uh, so thank you so much for watching this presentation and I wish you the best of luck with all of your videos.